One of the most factual things about the marathon, you could say, is that it's 26.2 miles, 42.2K, and that is never going to change. This series is all about learning to get the most out of yourself from the training perspective, as in getting the work done in the build-up that will prepare you to be the best prepared you can possibly be on race day, to extract the most out of your body for all that hard work that you put in. That, that should be the absolute least or minimum that you're content with on race day. Looking at that, today's episode or, or part of this series is about the actual demands of the marathon from the fact that it's 42.2K, 26.2 miles, that will never change. What sort of demands will that put on your body, physically, psychologically? And then what can you do in training? The actual specifics of training, what types of training help the marathon, long runs, mileage, intervals, hills, gym. So then we look at the actual specifics that could prepare you better for the demands of the race. And that's, in a nutshell, the, the bread and butter, you could say, of what's gonna give you the best chance on race day of actually performing well. So if we take a step back and we look at the demands of the marathon, I, I think I've stated it three or four times now, the distance, but that's a fairly obvious one that you should look at. You should be looking at how much running have I done, What's my longest run been? Have my quads, calves, hamstrings, feet, psychology, have they ever gone the distance? If not, then of course you're gonna have to plan for that. What about the demands of the race from a, it's 26.2 miles, you might be out there quite a long time. Well, where are you at in terms of preparation? in knowing that psychologically you'll hold it together for that length of time. So that race day is not this, you know, big shock that you've gone from, well, two hours is the most I've ever concentrated and focused and been in that zone of this isn't easy, I'm having to work hard. And then suddenly race day might be three and a half hours, four hours. Don't then be mad or upset that your, your brain isn't that into it. So all of these things would play a role before you even decide the specifics of the training, okay? So the other demands of the race would be, it's, it's a year out from, for example, the Paris Olympics, and the professionals that are hoping to qualify for the Paris Olympics, we're already looking at, it's an undulating course. You're already looking at the course profile. You're already looking a year ahead at, well, how's the weather right now? The race is in a year's time or less than a year's time, that might give you an idea of what the weather might be like on race day. And that's another demand of the course, things that you can't control. But what you can control is when you start to look at that training and, and you look at like how you might go about prescribing training, that that training could help you meet the demands of the race. So if you're gonna run a race that has hills or you're gonna run a race where it's hot, well then it makes sense in the training buildup to prepare for that specificity of the demands of the race. You understand? And so that's really important. You must prepare for the demands of the race. I, I ran Boston Marathon very poorly, I might add. I didn't feel like I could extract the most out of my body. And when I stood on the start line and the race just goes downhill, and I stood there going, I don't even know what to do. I haven't trained for this. I haven't ran downhills. I haven't ran uphills. So you must prepare for that. Most people might enter a marathon. Maybe they've raced a 5K, a 10K, and it's like, boom, I'm going to go do a marathon. So what you do in training is you build your training from, well, I've only ran 6 mile or, or 8 mile or 10 mile. And so you, you do build the volume. Things like 26.2 miles, 42.2K, a lot of pounding on the quads, a lot of pounding on the hamstrings, same as the calves. You need to put something in your plan to counteract that so that your body's ready for race day. So that's the demands of the race, physically, psychologically. What you then look at is your actual training. 
and the actual training, a lot of people go to the marathon, forgive me, but a lot of people think I'll go to the marathon. It's a bit more relaxed. I, I kind of just like running. I like getting out there. I like running with my friends. I like the social aspect. I like going a bit slower. Maybe you don't like track. Maybe you don't like hard intervals. That's some people. Some people do it because they got into running to kind of lose weight and, and then they caught the bug and their you know local place or city or town has a marathon and they're like, I'm gonna do the marathon. There's all different reasons why people come to marathon, but the marathon demands a lot. <laughs> it's not that you just get to run slower and so awesome. If you're well trained, you don't actually have to run that much slower than some of your other personal bests, like half marathon, 10K, and the body can keep going. But it's almost in some instances, the same discomfort from a psychological perspective as some of those other events. You can just, keep going when you're well trained. And so the training needs to still cover a lot of what the other events would have covered. So of course you're gonna to have to train for the distance, which means you're gonna to have to build those long runs, the, the longest run that you're gonna do each week. They must build both from a time perspective and from a speed perspective. Time, speed, and distance, sorry, actually three things. And so you can build yourself up over time, and if, you're, if your predicted goal is, you know, maybe it's three hours, well, you likely want to have done a long run or maybe two long runs around about that two hour 30 to, you know, two hour 45 mark. You might not do them at the speed of race day, of course, but what you will want to do is add the three together. So let's say, for example, you're starting off at 80 minutes or 60 minutes, you could probably add 10 to 20 minutes each week and then as time goes on and you get to two hours, you get to two hours 20, you get to two hours 40, what you can start to do after probably five or six weeks is you can add in some speed. And why you'd be adding in speed is what you could do is the first two hours, you could do at that normal run pace. And in the last 20 to 30 minutes, you could add in speed at marathon effort. Speed is ultimately the most important part of all this, right? Speed is what gets you from A to B as quickly as you can. And we're not talking Usain Bolt sprint speed, but the fastest person from A to B wins the race. Start line to finish line, the fastest person will win the race. And that's why if you go to marathon and you only focus on marathon training, for example, and you only do that long run and you build it up in terms of volume and time and, and distance, you know, and you neglect 5K fitness, 3K fitness, 10K fitness, half marathon fitness, what happens is that run speed that you've built, it kind of becomes your everything. And so you'll get like aerobically perhaps fitter, which is a strange word over time, but your, your ceiling will just come down, come down, come down, come down. When I've ran my absolute best marathons and my absolute best, say, half marathon in the buildup, perhaps, I've thought to myself that I likely could have ran a PB for 5K and 10K on marathon race day, or certainly within the, the three to four weeks leading into the marathon which means that you're stood on the start line. I'm gonna show you the graphic. They, they did a, what does it take to run the, you know, the sub two hour marathon? And, and, and that was the you know, best athlete, athletes in the world, the best physiologists in the world. And they, they put that online and, and you know, VO2 max is there and, and running economy is there and, and lactate threshold pace is there. And, and so in other words, if the best physiologists in the world believe that it was important for you know, these athletes to have their VO2 in its best place possible on the start line of the marathon to achieve the ultimate success, that makes it important for all of us. And so some people go to the marathon and one of the biggest mistakes is they think, I don't really have to do track work anymore. I might not have to do hard hills anymore. I might not have to do VO2 max training is, you know, perhaps you're gonna to go to a field and you're gonna do 10 times 60 seconds on the grass with you know maybe 90 seconds rest and, and, and a week later or two weeks later you could do 90 second intervals or two minute intervals. In other words, it's, it's hard, it's hard work. It gets your breathing going to the point that you feel a little bit anxious, a little bit under pressure because you are under pressure. You're howling, you're heaving, you might even hear yourself wheezing. 
And then over time, when you do that a couple of times, your, your breathing capacity gets better. It gets better at bringing oxygen in, giving it to the muscles, and you move forward. What I'm trying to say is, if you build your ceiling to be higher, your marathon pace, your marathon effort will be a percentage of your ceiling, okay? So if your ceiling is constantly coming down, your marathon pace or your marathon effort might be 90% of your ceiling. But if your ceiling has come down, come down, come down, 90% of this thing that's coming down might not be as good as it could have been if you maintained that. The key is maintain, right? So build it, start to add some of those sessions in, whether it's VO2, whether it's 10K fitness. I, I narrowed in on VO2, but think about all of this. Think about half marathon, think about 10K, think about 5K, and then VO2 as well. You're trying to work all of your zones within the running world, which means if your race pace is seven minutes per mile, well, you want to be better at running 8.30, eight minutes, 7.30, 7 minutes, 6.30, sorry, 7, 6.30, 6. You, you want to be better at running all of those speeds. And as you get better at running all of those speeds, everything shifts to the right. As it shifts to the right, that means that the effort it used to take to run 6.30 or 7, well, now maybe it's 6.45 and 6.15. If you narrow in on the pace that it's gonna take you to maybe run your sub three hour marathon, and you think that's the only important pace, the level of difficulty that it takes to run maybe 10 to 15 seconds quicker than that pace or 30 seconds quicker or 15 to 20 seconds or 30 seconds slower, the level of difficulty to run those paces might increase because guess what? You neglected it. You're not working on it. So it's important to get these other intensities, these other speeds to a good place and then manage them. So you might have to do, at the beginning of your buildup, you might have to do more VO2 work, more 5K work, more 10K work to get those into a good place. And then as the buildup goes on, you might find that so long as I do one of those VO2 sessions every sort of two to three weeks, I keep that in a pretty good place. But don't build it and then lose it. Don't for four or five weeks focus on 5K fitness, run a 5K personal best, then start a 10 week marathon buildup and maybe if you did another 5K five weeks into that marathon buildup, you'd run 30 seconds to a minute slower than you did when you ran your, you know, your 5K PB at the end of that initial 45 weeks. Don't build an asset and then let it go. Build your assets and keep them. I know that I didn't get into the massive specifics of the training, but I really just wanted to highlight that it's so important to not just go down a path of, all I'm gonna do is marathon type fitness, marathon training, marathon training, marathon training. To run your best marathon, to run ultimately the best potential that perhaps you have, you're gonna consider the demands of the race, course, distance, 100%, psychologically where are you at in terms of that amount of time. But in the training buildup, yes, you're gonna build up you know, your long runs to make sure that you've got that covered. Yes, you're gonna perhaps do some longer tempo runs at marathon pace because that's important. It's obvious if you wanna run sub three hours for the marathon, two hours 59, work out what pace that is and you want to have spent a good amount of time at that pace. Mile reps, two mile reps, three mile reps, maybe even like a 10 to 12 mile tempo at that pace. That's important. But do not neglect VO2, 3K fitness, 5K fitness, 10K fitness, half marathon, you must keep those things in a good place or as they drop and your ceiling drops, marathon effort is always a percentage of your max effort, a percentage of your max speed. Keep those areas in a good place and you will run very, very well. You will find not just marathon effort easily or easier in terms of the pace, but you're just gonna find it psychologically a lot easier because you're used to doing the 90 second hill reps that are a ball buster, let's call it, and then all of a sudden you settle back to that marathon effort and it's like, lovely. If you wanna check out more on this, you can go to joggingroom.com. That's part two where I dove into a little bit of the training and the demands of the race. Part one went through figuring out where your fitness is at and then planning how long it might take to get yourself towards the marathon rather than you know just winging it and perhaps showing up on race day and not being in a good place. And yeah, who knows what part three will be about, but we'll explore more about the marathon. If I need to talk about the training more, we'll do that. But I hope this helps.